So hello and welcome to Data for What? Building shared understanding between civil society documenters and investigators. Um, so we're based in Seoul right now. Um, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit about our project before we start. Um, so we're the Transitional Justice Working Group. Uh, we started in Seoul about seven years now. Um, and as we've been learning how to document abuses in North Korea, um, we realized that along the way we got a lot of great feedback and learned a lot from other experts and then other civil society and NGOs as well. So while our flagship project is our North Korean human rights documentation work, um, we have a sub project here called Access Accountability. Uh, and our mission is to share resources and facilitate peer to peer learning among NGOs, uh, especially those who are collecting uh, documentation to support transitional justice mechanisms. Uh, so I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Scott Stevens. I'm a co-founder of the Transitional Justice Working Group and the project manager for Access Accountability. Um, our project coordinator, Yurim Choi, is also here with us today, and she's managing the technical issues and helping us uh, keep connected after the session as well. Um, so a little bit of history about the conversation for today. We've had this idea for about a year now. Um, it came out of a RightsCon panel in 2020 when one of our speakers, Sun Kim, suggested that actually, you know, we need to have some kind of conversation about what is work for lawyers and what is work for civil society. Um, so from there, that conversation, we started to think more and develop this idea. Um, and eventually it evolved into the lineup for today, um, featuring documenters and investigators working in Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and beyond. Um, but the real goal here is to help both investigators and civil society documenters to understand how their data can be used effectively, um, and on the one side collected well, and on the other side utilized well. So our speakers for today uh, in, will be Eois Albudush, uh, Claudelis Santos, Dr. Kathy Roberts, Dr. Mary Menton, and Sun Kim. Um, we're also hoping that today's conversation isn't just a one-off event, but that instead it leads to future discussion and opportunities for follow-up collaborations and knowledge sharing after the session. Uh, whether that be further online conversations like this one, training, or peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing, uh, we're not sure yet, but let's make sure to keep in touch. So if there are any questions at any point, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them during the Q&A. Uh, if you look at the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a, a triangle, a circle, and a square. If you click on that icon and then click on the Q&A, um, that will keep a clear record of the questions. Um, but if you also post them in the chat, that's fine too. We'll see them there as well. Um, and then also the after the session as well, if you have any questions that you didn't get to ask or want to connect with one of the speakers, um, you can send an email to info at accessaccountability.org uh, and we'll connect you to the right people from there. Uh, I'd also like to just give a quick heads up and a reminder that the conversation is being recorded um, and then we're going to post it on YouTube later so that people couldn't who couldn't join the live session today can catch up later on. Um, but if you would like your identity to be removed or a question to be removed, uh, while we're editing the video, we can make sure to cover names, change voices, or just simply delete sections. Um, so please let us know in the chat or by email afterwards, and we'll make sure to do that. Uh, so without further delay, uh, I'll introduce our first speakers. Um, to start off, we wanted to frame the conversation starting from the grassroots perspective. So our first section will actually be a, a pre-recorded description, um, but to frame the pre-recorded description, I'll pass things over to Dr. Mary Menton. It's, this is a really great opportunity for, for us as a project. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing and the context, I am both a research fellow at the University of Sussex, but I also work with Not One More, which is a nonprofit um, that works with frontline environmental defenders, um, both doing active support to those at risk, but also trying to understand the root causes of violence against them and the threats against them. So we have been working in several different countries, but particularly today speaking from a Latin American perspective in Brazil, 
Um, and the video will be from Clara Lisi Santos, who is a grassroots social movement organizer, human rights defender, but also a law student. Um, and we work together with also lawyers from the uh, Pastoral Land Commission or CPT, if you're familiar with their work in Brazil on documenting violence against, again, land defenders, environmental defenders and others. Um, so we come very much a little bit down the middle in a sense, because we are both um, academics, but also grassroots organizers, but also lawyers. Um, but one of the main goals of the project that we're working on is to train the frontline activists who are receiving the threats or are experiencing the violence to be able to document what's going on and to do it safely. So we have started working together with Horizontal, who are the developers of an app called Tela, which um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but if you look in the app store, you can, <laughs> that's, the, that's what it looks like in terms of the logo, if you want to download it and, and have a look about how it works. Um, but one of the things we've been working with Tela to do is to adapt it to the, to, to the reality of Brazil on the ground in terms of making it very easy and plug and play and, and sort of minimizing the, the tech knowledge that people need in order to actually use the app. And one of those things is so fundamental that it be usable offline, that it be hidden, that it be secure. You know, all of these things are very much important. And so that, that's what we're at, at sort of the test running stage now after having received feedback from grassroots organizers and um, threatened defenders on the ground about what they need to be able to, to document things more clearly. Um, and really what we're trying to do is make sure, I think there's two things, right? There's the benefit of collecting the data so that we document what's going on and, and we can really understand the patterns and who's being threatened and who needs support. And that's kind of at the minimum, that's what we will definitely achieve. But I think we're at a point where we would also very much like for this data to be usable as evidence. And so that's why this invitation to come today is, is coming at a really, a really good point for us because we're about to start a really more, more intensive data collection and training. And so it's really important for us to understand you know, what, what do you as investigators, as lawyers need from us? Um, because right now, as it stands, people are taking, you know, taking pictures on their mobile phones and sending them to CPT, but they don't have any megadata. They don't have any of that sort of the detail, the nitty gritty to, to make them much more usable potentially in court. And so that's that's sort of the context of, of where we're coming at. And so Claudia Lisi will talk a little bit more about what's going on. She mentions Tela, so I, I think it was important that I speak a little bit before just to explain that that's what she's talking about. Um, and yeah, we see in Brazil, you know, that it's, it's people have certain freedoms, but there's been a regression in terms of crackdowns on, on civil society, uh, criminalization of environmental activists, human rights defenders. And so they're at a very much at a point where we need to be very careful about how we collect the data, making sure that the people in the field are safe as they do so, um, but also gathering evidence to be able to, to hopefully bring about some positive change. So I'll stop there uh, and leave time for Claudia Lise's Olá a todos, eu sou Claudelice Santos, coordenadora do Instituto Zé Cláudio Maria, aqui no Pará, na Amazônia Brasileira. É, primeiro dizer que é uma honra estar participando desse evento e que também é de extrema importância para nós, sobretudo nos últimos anos, onde vem se recrudescendo a violência contra a ativista né, dos direitos humanos e do meio ambiente. O TELA, para nós, nesse momento, está sendo uma oportunidade, né? é uma esperança, mas também uma oportunidade de avançarmos nas questões, principalmente de provas, né? de elaborarmos, de conseguirmos provas 
é, que nos coloque em outro patamar de justiça. Porque o que vem acontecendo até agora né, com os processos judiciais é que muitos deles não avançam, né, é, logicamente, porque... N coisas, mas uma delas é essa questão das provas. A maior parte delas são testemunhais, né? não são provas, uh, como que eu posso dizer mais materialmente falando, de foto, vídeo, áudio, são testemunhais. E a maioria dessas pessoas que se testemunham né, sobre violação de direitos humanos, elas são desconsideradas, desclassificadas, desmoralizadas, inclusive em júri. Então, o TELA vem para a gente também como essa oportunidade né, de irmos para outro patamar na questão das provas jurídicas. As nossas metas, principalmente com o TELA, é fazer com que esse, é, com esse aplicativo ele chegue ao máximo possível a defensores de linha de frente. Aí temos algumas barreiras que estamos, através do projeto que estamos executando juntos, é, tentando é, ultrapassar essas barreiras da melhor forma possível. A maioria dos defensores, por exemplo, eles não falam língua estrangeira, outro idioma. Então, esses, isso já é uma barreira. Esse aplicativo ele tem que ser acessível com relação ao idioma. Segunda coisa, ele precisa ser de fácil acessibilidade no, na questão do manuseio. É, a maioria dos defensores de linha de frente tem celulares simples né, e tem é, pouco conhecimento com essas questões mais da tecnologia digital. Então, o, esse aplicativo, ele precisa ser né, de fácil acessibilidade e manuseio e é isso que está sendo trabalhado e é para a gente está sendo assim um uma oportunidade muito grande de acessarmos a um aplicativo especificamente para isso e que vai ajudar nós em nossas lutas. Né? Então, principalmente na produção desse tipo de prova para alguns tipos de, de, de violências específicas, como, por exemplo, uma comunidade que é, é invadida por fazendeiros ou por garimpeiros, né? é, acessar esses aplicativos mesmo em modo offline para criar essas provas é, é um desafio muito grande porque você está no momento de tensão, você está no momento de terror e você precisa acessar rapidamente né? e fácil, facilmente um aplicativo que grave áudios, né? que gra filme ou que tire fotos. Essas são as principais é, provas que nós precisamos nos casos jurídicos e que nós entendemos que existe uma, uma dificuldade muito grande, principalmente dos defensores de, de linha, de frente, né, de, de, de comunidades é, isoladas ou humildes, é, acessar esses aplicativos offline, né, conseguir fazer isso de modo seguro. Porque o que, que acontece? Não adianta a gente fi, é, filmar na câmera normal de um celular, por exemplo, que quem tiver fazendo a violência vai tomar esse celular, vai quebrar, vai acabar com a memória e acabou. O importante é que esses dados eles sejam coletados de forma segura para o defensor que estiver fazendo, para a pessoa que estiver fazendo. Né? Então, o Tela para a gente tem essa, esse, essa oportunidade da gente ver esperança na produção desse tipo de prova para os processos. Porque o que, mais, o que mais nós temos dificuldade, dificuldade é em é, é, termos provas, né? criarmos provas, é conseguir provas materialmente falando, áudio, foto, vídeo né? das violações. E em, algum, em alguns casos é, até consegue, mas é, não com qualidade boa ou com, com pouca... É, com poucos elementos que fortaleça né, a tese da violação. E na, no caso das testemunhas, é, são desclassificadas, desconsideradas. Então, para fortalecer é, tanto essa construção de provas, como também ah, o, o manuseio disso, é preciso um trabalho em conjunto. Né, e exatamente isso que a gente está fazendo agora entre os programadores do TELA, entre os criadores do TELA, e nós, das comunidades de base, os defensores que estão ali de frente para conseguir chegar a um modo ideal 
né, de aplicativo, de instrumento que nos traga essa segurança para criar provas para possíveis processos, tanto aqui quanto fora. Muito obrigada. I think Clarice might have have joined, even if it's just for her to, to say hello, Clau, was it aí? <laughs> Sim, boa tarde a todos, eu estou. <laughs> She's saying hello to everyone and she is here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that the together what what we've just said, hopefully, is pretty clear. And and I think one of the things that, again, going back to the information that's already out there in Brazil, we do know that from the most recent CPT report on violence in the fields that while the number of murders may have decreased in the last couple of years, the number of land invasions, the number of threatened people is, is increasing. And so it becomes um, really important when we think about the, the communities, as Clau was saying, they're in, they're in remote areas, they don't have access to good phones. It really is about spreading spreading our network as, as far as we can to make sure the biggest number of people are able to collect information because they're the ones that are seeing it firsthand. And, and, and I think that's kind of what we're trying to do is, is increase that network and make sure as many people as possible have access to both the app and the understanding of, of what, what they should be collecting and what information is most useful. Um, and it becomes increasingly urgent as the violence is increasing. Um, yeah, I think I think I mean we could talk longer, but I think that I think that's enough, <laughs> enough for now. Um, Great. But, but yeah. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, there are a lot of topics in there about uh, collecting evidence, but in a kind of dispersed way, and uh, the security of the people collecting the evidence, but then again, the utility of the evidence that's being collected. Um, and by dispersing the research like that, it's, I think we're, most of us are used to kind of the pen and paper method, but it's an interesting, interesting idea to disperse it this way. And I'd be curious to see um, what the implications are for, for the investigators on the other side using that data. So thank you. We'll next uh, turn over to Ayois Albadouche, uh, the Legal and Human Rights Advisor uh, at the Syria, and Ju Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Uh, he's a human rights lawyer with experience uh, as an attorney practicing uh, at levels in Syrian courts and a, and a variety of different uh, civil and criminal matters. Uh, but he also has experience with NGOs um, and specifically um, his work uh, with the with SJAC, the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Um, they have their own unique data collection methods and we'll be hearing a little bit about how they use that for their advocacy as well. Thanks so much, Scott. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wes al -Dubos. Uh, actually, I'm happy like, to be here and thanks for inviting me for sharing uh, our extract experience in Syria and actually to learn from the others. Uh, I will give you like uh, firstly an overview on, on SJAC and on our works and how we like collecting data and then how we like processing this data and writing this data. Actually, SJAC is working on three areas. SJAC is um, a non-profit organization. It's like working for uh, human rights in Syria based on, uh, on Washington DC. It's established on 2012. Uh, actually, we are working on, uh, on uh, or focusing on three areas. The first area is the documentation. Uh, actually, we're collecting the documentation or documenting the all human rights abuses and international crimes in Syria, regardless of affiliation against all the parties in, in Syria on the ground. Uh, we, we collect this information or this data actually from, from our coordinators. We have our field coordinators on the ground and also we have like some networks and some partners what we call data source on the ground. Then actually after like this process, we have like the next step which is called like data analysis. After we receive this data from the ground, actually, we move it forward to our data analysis team. We have like our own database. I will present later our database, which is called Bayanat. Actually, data analysis team, they are working on uh, processing and analyzing these data and catalog these data in different area. So I also I will present our data analysis, the, the, our uh, database later. Uh, this, this data analysis actually processes 
takes a lot of time for processing and analyzing and extracting the metadata from the videos, for example. As, as you see here, actually we start, for example, like uh, mapping the violation in Syria and cities in the town and also the old potential elite perpetrators, ISIS, the Syrian government, and other, and also we try to categorize all victims, whatever armed or minors or, or, or civil or male, female or male. Uh, this is like a screenshot from our database and how it's do it. We, we, we try to, to process our data. Actually, we categorize them in three categories. The first one, which we call like uh, the bulletin. Bulletin, which is called any, any, any evidences, any piece of data, picture, videos we processing here. Actors, any, uh, it refers for uh, perpetrators, sometimes it refers for witnesses, for um, victims, actually we call actors. Then we have an, uh, an incident, everything is like going to the incidents. Uh, finally, we, we establish the incident after we link between the, the actors and the bulletins and we have like finally the, the incident which might be support any any potential investigation in the future uh, let me give you an example how it works actually uh, here uh, we received like a random documentation from the ground, for example, from different source. The first video that we received, I just like take a screenshot from the, from this video. The first video is here, actually, which showed like as you see some soldiers. It's like and the, uh, the official or senior government soldiers. They are torturing a guy. Uh, this happened in 2013 that we received like this video from one from the one data source on the ground. Uh, they they have been tortured like this guy. Actually, it was like just a video for torturing. We keep in our database, we extract the metadata and analyzing this video. Later, actually, we received other video after like a few couple of months, which like uh, this video showed the family of this guy after he has been died. It seems it, it showed the, the torture on his body, and they, and they actually they they pronounce his name in the video. We extract all the metadata and we collect, we link between the, those two videos actually from from uh, from different sources on the ground. We link to to to, uh, to the as I mentioned to the incident. So. So right now we have like the video for torturing the, this guy and which showed like the, the faces, the rank, everything or the badges for the soldiers who have been tortured this guy and we have like the, 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 the other video for his family once he is preparing for, for funeral. Uh, later actually, after that, after I think two years, we received an, an, a document which like a leaked document from some security facilities which showed like this is an order, an intelligence report, which showed an order for killing this guy, this name of this guy. So which like signed from a command uh, and one commander. So right now we have like a full incident, which like the first video and the second video and also the, the, the document that showed uh, what is happening and what's, what's, who is like issued this order for killing this guy. So the the always like we we advise for any uh, for our coordinators or any like documenters or human rights defenders on the ground to call like any documentation any information as much as possible and don't leave anything behind you you don't know when and where you will you you might use this data actually so as i mentioned like this is our main area the third area is like uh, on transitional justice we try like to to, to discover the best pathways for transitional justice for syria so for for the documentation and the data as i mentioned uh, which we always try to collect as much as possible information we don't know when and where we might be use it for example let me give you an example actually recently as you know there is some some like uh, available or live uh, way for justice in the EU uh, based on the universal jurisdiction. So there is some cases, some investigate, ongoing investigations around. Uh, we start like coordination with the prosecutors and work transnet and international mechanisms around. Uh, after like we we, we receive some requests. Um, I, I have like an own experience. Once I joined to SJAC in 2014, I conducted an interview with one witness. He was like a survivor from one military security um, prison in Syria in, in 2012. Actually, I conducted this interview in 2014. It was like after journey to Israel with three months. Actually, I ever imagined that I might be used it at least in the, in the upcoming 20, 30 years as you see, like the, the hope for for justice for Syria, it's too low, too it's too far, or no one know actually when when the, the comprehensive justice might be come. Uh, in 2020, I received a request from the French prosecutor. He asked me for a specific incident 
that have been in this like uh, prison in Syria, and he is looking for some witnesses who have been there, who have been maybe experienced torture. He might be testify and accepted for that. Actually, I step back to 2014, step back uh, six or seven years uh, behind me, and I found like this interview is ready and find like this witness is ready and survivor is ready to testify so any with any 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 testimony any incident any the evidence it's, it's really important to keep our eyes on it so uh, the other the other like uh, the other story also in, in germany uh, also I, I i received like a request from the workers in germany they are searching or are investigating in, in specific case also happened in some in one military base in syria so also actually I, I came back to our database and searching in our documentation, we found like some some open source videos and some open source like data. Also we found a relevant witness directly he witnessed the, the incident and he witnessed the extra tragical killing that happened there in this military base. So this this data sometimes we, we don't know actually when or where we can find it in the future. Actually for that, uh, we, which, um, we're thinking at SGI to look, actually we put all of our efforts and experience to, to support human rights defenders and documenters on the ground in two, in two areas. The first area is like we established a training platform uh, to in-phase or enhance the, the capacity of the human rights defenders on the ground and also for the quality of the data, which should be like made that some criteria or international standards to be acceptable in, in the future. Because actually after we experienced some, some, some cases based on universal jurisdiction in, in the EU, we found like some data has not been useless or not be accepted because the lack of the some criteria, the lack, for example, of chain of custody, the lack of info consent and other criteria. So actually we developed like this that, uh, the training platform is totally free. I, I will present it right now. It's in Arabic. Actually we started for, for our like uh, our own team basically or for Syria also for Syrian human rights defenders and all and later we start sharing in the MENA for the Libyan and Yemeni and Iranian and Iraqi human rights defenders and here is like on our website it's free everyone can access for for uh, for this database actually or training platform sorry so you can find like uh, three categories of our 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 um, our training so you can access for example for documenting the violation you can find uh, uh, an introductory video here and here different type of violation or international crime see for example this is for uh, sexual violence you can access here and find a video uh, which show like uh, explains the situation and, and the best practices, best uh, uh, practice skills documentation, which is like the most important questions that you have to to uh, to um, ask for the survivors, for example. So uh, it's really, really practical training. It's not theoretical training and not academic training. We try like to put all of our experience on the ground on this like, training platform. Also, there is a material, it's, it's like, uh, and like small material, it's not too long material, so they can access. Actually, we have the materials both in English and in Arabic, and we, we also like can share like the materials based on some requests. Uh, finally, we have like some scenarios, some quiz here just for supporting the human rights defenders. So we have like around 17 um, training course right now on our training platform, and it's free and anyone can access directly to it. Actually, it's, uh, it's in Arabic, so it's um, uh, opening for Arabic speakers and maybe we hope like to have like some something in English but as I mentioned like we have the materials in English and we are happy to share for the other uh, the other area actually for the for the data analysis as I, as I mentioned without like um, uh, if you if you collect like a huge number of data and without um, processing and analyzing and extracting the metadata and catalog everything you can you cannot share in the future and you, and, and you will be swamped on, on the huge numbers of data for example as you see here, before I presented my, my uh, our database, uh, we collected millions of pieces of data or documentation from the ground. So without like have this organized database and flow database, you will you cannot like share or, or might be not be useful in the future. Here is our bayanat. Uh, our database, uh, as I mentioned, like that, our database have been developed uh, and 
uh, for for our processing and analyzing our data and documentation. Uh, it's it's really it's not, it's not complicated actually for use. I will present the video right now for you. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, also we we can. Um, we can provide actually the software of data for any human rights groups, for example, based on, on some requests. It's, it's also free. Anyone can access and, and can, for example, install our software, the software for the program of the data, and they can use the same similar data. To exact. I will present it right now. It's just a short video, just a three, three minutes from our video, just to give you an, 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 a full picture of what, what we are doing in our database. This is Bayanat an open source data management solution for processing huge amounts of data relevant to human rights abuses and war crimes. Fully developed by Syrian talents at the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Bayanat was created to enable human rights defenders, activists and organizations to easily collect, organize, catalog and analyze documentation of war crimes, crimes against humanity and human rights violations. The Syria Justice and Accountability Center developed this software internally, based on open source platforms. The goal is for SJAC to continue working on collecting and analyzing documentation of potential violations committed during the Syrian conflict by all sides. In addition to allowing other human rights activists and organizations working on documenting violations around the world to easily embed and use Bayanat for documentation and analysis purposes. In late 2020, SJAC launched the newest and enhanced version of its data management software, Bayanat. SJAC used its eight years of first-hand experience in collecting, preserving, analyzing, and sharing documentation of the human rights violations to build Bayanat. The main user interface has left ribbon for the navigation and the database, logout and settings, as well as switcher for the language of the user interface. The main portion of the page shows the items list. The user can customize the number of items that appear at one time and also navigate between the pages of the list. Clicking on an item in the list shows the item page on the right. This preview shows the fields that contain data in any item and the related items attached to it. At the bottom of the preview ribbon, the user can view the history of an item. The list shows every edit to an item. And there is a detailed history button that shows exactly what changed in every update. On the top of the page, there is a search bar for text contained in the items. There is also an advanced search button that allows the user to search in every field in the database. The three main components in the database are actors, bulletins and incidents. Bulletins are pieces of evidence and materials such as videos, documents, images and audio files. Actors are profiles of persons or entities, for example, victim reports or profiles of armed groups or government agencies and other corporations. Incidents are like folders where the items in actors and bulletins can be organized and analyzed together in depth to investigate a larger incident. So this is like some experience from the Syrian conflict, it's really hard once you are working from outside Syria, you, you don't have like an access to the area which like the, 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 the violations have been happening in, in, inside Syria. So uh, thanks so much and I, I, I will stop here. So thank you for that. Um, I would encourage everyone actually, uh, if you are looking for a database solution, check out Bionat. Um, we can post links to um, Actually, all of the speakers' websites, but um, it does really look like a like quite a powerful tool. Especially what you're saying about the the permissions and the record of who accessed uh, what piece of documentation um, for chain of custody later on. I think is a really powerful aspect.
Um, and then also in the chat, um, Christine from Docs has also uh, mentioned that Tela uh, is compatible with Uwazi. Um, so uh, one of our projects as well is uh, Uwazi powered. Uh, again, a very powerful tool, um, very good for visualization and storing data in different places. Um, so maybe in the Q&A, um, if there's questions from some of the documenters here, we could talk about how to decide what kind of tool to use, uh, depending on what kind of um, uh, justice mechanism or uh, investigation you're you're working with or expecting. Uh, all right, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Kathleen Roberts. Um, she's represented victims and survivors of human rights violations and international atrocity crimes uh, in court for over 15 years. Um, so she has extensive trial experience. Um, she's led and supervised investigation of grave crime scene, uh, gra grave crimes cases um, from 12 countries spanning five continents. Um, and her work representing victims has also been featured in global media outlets and even a Netflix special. Uh, Dr. Roberts is core faculty at the Institute for International Criminal Investigations and served for a number of years as an adjunct professor at the University of San Francisco. Um, so uh, her topic today will be quite a unique one. She's going to be talking about uh, public and private sector collaboration on international crime investigations and prosecutions. Okay, thank you, Scott. And thanks to the Transitional Justice Working Group for convening this panel. I'm really honored to um, share a panel with these distinguished uh, individuals, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't, but uh, very excited to be here. Um, I do have a little bit of a presentation, so I'll go ahead and share that. And yeah, I took the topic a little bit on the, a little bit literally, <laughs> looking at um, facilitating collaboration between civil society and law enforcement in their approaches to documenting international crimes. So that's, um, yeah, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, let's see here. Why am I not clicking through? There we go. Um, so a little bit about me while well, I was going to introduce myself, but Scott did a lovely job. I have been working for about 17 years on behalf of victims and survivors of human rights violations and grave international crimes. Um, so I've done the investigation, I've done the litigation, I've done the advocacy. So I really have a good understanding of, um, of, of sort of the different roles that are involved, but we'll just scoot right along. Um, building on that experience for the last couple of years, a colleague of mine, Maxine Marcus, and I have been developing uh, an approach to sort of taking our experience. I've worked as a victim's representative, uh, as a, a human rights organization, civil society person. She's worked as a prosecutor, as an investigator um, for the tribunals. Um, so we have developed this, this method over the last few years and just launched our um, our nonprofit organization, actually, we just launched it in March, Partners in Justice International. We've been doing this work together for about the last six years, um, where essentially we take that experience that we've had over the years and we bring it in service of local um, documenters and investigators, prosecutors, victim attorneys, really whoever is advancing um, accountability, advancing uh, justice for victims, um, in the countries that were suffering from abuse. So that's that's the work that we're doing now. And um, one of the things that we've learned that's really key, and, and which I think we knew, but we've learned it in a deeper way, is the importance of collaboration between civil society and law enforcement to even get these things moving, at least at the national level. It's crucial. Um, so I have some key messages. These are um, not hidden. <laughs> my my agenda is quite clear. Um, so first of all, civil society documenters and law enforcement or other, I'd say government aligned investigators. And what I'm really thinking of are sort of the UN uh, commissions of inquiry or, or international tribunals or, you know, these kind of investigative mechanisms that have recently started moving forward. They're, they're created by governments. I'm not quite sure what to call them. Um, Sun will probably tell us. Um, but between civil society and these kind of more government aligned investigations, there's often really good reasons not to collaborate. There's really good reasons not to trust each other. This is particularly true for national police and national documenters um, because they have that history, right? Um, but at the same time, they often need 
each other in order to accomplish certain goals and in particular justice for victims of mass atrocity crimes. Um, so I'm, I, I'm here to say um, one thing that I think is very possible is to overcome many of the barriers, maybe not all of them, but many of them can be overcome in a practical way, um, taking account of the realities and risks and benefits within each of their mandates. Um, so I think it's worth pausing for a moment, and I, I think this came through um, in the prior presentations, um, but the, the context that we're talking about here is one where there's not going to be a whole lot of judicial accountability. So talking about judicial accountability happens in a context where most victims are not going to see justice, where you're not going to see an accountability process. And this, this image that I'm offering you right now is not representative um, most countries will not have, for example, the possibility of an ICC prosecution. Many will not have the possibility of local judicial accountability, and many will not have any kind of transitional justice mechanism like a truth commission or, or something else. But, but even when you have sort of the best case scenario, you don't have that much in the way of judicial accountability. So when you're documenting, when you're investigating, you, you know, you may not know where your in where your information is going to end up, where your evidence, what jurisdiction it's going to end up in, whether it will get to a jurisdiction. It may be that your investigative interviews are the closest that certain victims and survivors will get to an actual forum. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. I know I don't need to tell this group that there are a million barriers to justice, um, but I felt it important just to note them. You know, there's obviously quite a lot, <laughs> quite a lot in the way, quite a lot that can prevent justice from happening. Um, even where you have a judicial system functioning, um, you know, everybody's not gonna get prosecuted. It's not gonna be possible to build cases for every victim, even though those victims may be entitled to justice. So that's just that's just more more context, okay. But now, okay, so with that context, I think we can drill down a little bit on um, the judicial process, and in particular, the different roles that these different um, different individuals or different um, organizations can play. In particular, you'll see that, you know, from this image, and this is, you know, I've got a courtroom here that's obviously Nuremberg. Not every system has a victim lawyer role. Um, every system has a prosecutor or defense counsel role. Um, Government or government aligned investigators, CSO documenters, they don't necessarily have access directly to the court. Um, so there is a kind of there is a kind of relationship there, right? Um, civil society documenters are most often aligned um, with the victims and the need for justice. Um, they often lack the training or license to start a case, and maybe a victim lawyer um, provides that, but but they are not fully self-sufficient. Um, government investigators and prosecutors may share some of that alignment, but they also have to consider the evidence impartially. They, they have to respect not only the rights of the victims, but also of the defendants. And, and of course, defense counsel, among other things, are going to be charged with ensuring the procedural fairness and ensuring, um, you know, they may have a few things to say about how the evidence was collected. And that's something that everybody in the courtroom has got to take account of. So it's something that anybody doing documentation is going to have to take account of. Um, now, I think that it is clear, and I think that I, I've heard it already in the first two speakers, that there are some concerns um, that can be raised about CSO documentation. This, these are most often, in my experience, coming from law enforcement um, and people who have, or prosecutors and, and investigators who have not worked with a lot of CSOs before, and sometimes those that have. Right. There's concerns about integrity of the evidence. There's concerns about whether the evidence has been, you know, properly presented. Right. Have 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 leading questions been asked Were ideas planted? Has the, the statement been presented in a way that's kind of fixed? That's kind of, you know, that that maybe includes some personal biases and observations on behalf of the documenter. Um, my, my strong suggestion um, is that any any serious CSO who's documenting, particularly taking witness statements, which is usually what we have available in these kind of contexts, that they should get some training on how best to conduct that documentation or or even be speaking with 
if they know the jurisdiction is going to go, you know, be sure the documentation is welcome. Um, and they should be documenting their own methodology in the process. Now, one particular, well, actually, let me stop there and give you an example. Um, there was a, a trial in the United States. It was a, it was a immigration fraud trial against uh, somebody who had perpetrated war crimes, but for lots of um, legal reasons that I won't go into, it needed to be an immigration fraud trial for having lied about being a war criminal, right? Um, but the defense raised all kinds of issues about the the NGO that had had um, facilitated some of the testimony, right? They they argued that the NGO was interviewing witnesses, that the U.S. government was using them to pre-interview witnesses, but you know, so there was missing evidence or you know, that they were um, putting their bias into the into the sort of agenda of the prosecution that the prosecution was being used by uh, this NGO. And, and I've heard this kind of thing um, really commonly, actually. It's a it's a it's a compelling defense or it can be a compelling defense. It wasn't in this case. Um, in, the, in this case, the prosecution went forward and there was a conviction, but it can be. Um, and then finally, the third one I've mentioned here is evidence can be partially presented or withheld altogether. Um, this is one that I have found actually surprisingly common in a couple of places where there is a feeling on the part of our colleagues in law enforcement that certain NGOs are, are withholding their, their victims. They're, they're not allowing their vict the victims um, to talk to the police or the police are not being allowed access to their evidence. And I think this is actually usually a misunderstanding. Um, and so this is so if that if that was some bracing information for, for CSOs, then this is some bracing information for law enforcement. That is that um, you know, every every CSO, every NGO has its own mandate and mission, and none of them are going to be mandated or going to have a primary mission of making law enforcement's job easier. Right? That isn't the primary job of most of us who work in civil society. Right? We have <laughs> we have a particular mission. I'll take for example um, the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. There, they have a lot of information about victims of human rights violations. Right? A lot of information. They know where the people are, who's holding them, whether they've been abused, et cetera, et cetera. And they will never share that information with law enforcement because if it did, if they did, they would no longer get access to jails and prisons around the world and they would not be able to fulfill their own mission. So, you know, Amnesty has a similar position. So knowing what the mandate is and understanding, so my strong advice um, to anyone in law enforcement who's trying to conduct this kind of investigation and sees an NGO as a barrier, it's really come to understand whether what that NGO's mandate is and whether there is some overlap that can be, that can be fruitful. Um, but remember that just like it's not the victim's job to talk to you, it's not their job to um, hand over evidence that they've collected or hand over victims who may or may not actually want to talk to you. Um, so that's, those, those are sort of a couple of cautions. Okay. Now, from a more positive perspective, a more practical perspective, there are certain advantages that public and private actors can, can play that, that they have, sorry, that roles that they can play that are a little bit different. For example, CSO documenters are often freer to travel, right? They're, they're able to get access to evidence that's harder to reach. Um, that may be because they don't have to work through an embassy and get permission or whatever, or giant bureaucracies, or, you know, it may be for, for other reasons. Um, much more often or very often, CSO documenters have the trust of a survivor population. They, that, they're they well known with that survivor population, which means that they're more likely to talk to them about um, their experiences. By the same token, they often have a, an understanding of the security situation with greater clarity than those who are less involved with that population day to day. On the other hand, government and government aligned investigators may have access to security information and victim and witness protection measures that CSOs can only dream about. Um, they may be in a position to facilitate witness and victim travel to court. They may be able to take measures to prevent or mitigate threats. Like there, there are th they can do different things. So it's really wonderful 
when you can find a way to, to work them all together. Um, at the litigation stage, and I apologize for this slide, if I'd had more time, it would have been shorter. <laughs> it's too much, too much text on this slide, but essentially, um, I would like to suggest that you can see the public and private sort of roles also can play out in court in a way that's really productive and helpful. You know, obviously, you can't have a prosecution or an arrest without some involvement of government actors. Um, at the same time, if the government doesn't want to move forward, perhaps investigators, you know, um, prosecutors, judges have some issue, maybe the CSOs are able to sort of push things along a little bit more. Um, but what I think is actually maybe more common and, and really more interesting to me is that um, often in, in situations that are politically fraught, which is always in a, a situation that is post-dictatorship or post-conflict, um, certainly during them as well, um, that, you know, uh, somebody who's working as a prosecutor or a government investigator may be subject to political pressures that make it impossible for them, for example, to, to you know, lay a certain charge or to, um, you know, take a more emphatic position with respect to certain, certain um, suspects. Um, but perhaps the CSOs and the victim lawyers are less susceptible to that pressure because they don't work within that system and they may be able to sort of counterbalance that position and allow things to move forward. Um, I do think it is generally a best practice for government actors, prosecutors, investigators to consistently have in-depth meetings with particularly the victim lawyers, but CSOs in the absence of victim lawyers to be sure that there's, they're not missing something crucial in their case. All right. So bringing it on home, I did want to hopefully um, inspire you that there are there have been some a number of really successful collaborations. I'll bring a couple from my experience litigating cases in the U.S. and a couple from my experience working with um, CSOs um, in this in this new capacity that um, that Partners of Justice International is taking forward. Um, first, the Hara versus Barrientos case. So you can see there we are, right, waiting the, for the verdict. We did win. Um, that was relating to the 1973 torture and summary execution of Victor Hara during the Kenosha coup. Um, we were contacted initially by the Human Rights Prosecution Unit in Chile. We collaborated with them on building the civil case. If they hadn't reached out to, to the, the NGO where I was working, which is the Center for Justice and Accountability, there never would have been such a case. Uh, we then provided all of our evidence, you know, back to the Chileans, but also to the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security um, in support of the uh, extradition request. Um, hopefully, uh, the defendant in that case will be extradited, but if not, um, hopefully he'll be denaturalized and deported, if not extradited. So if that does happen, you know it'll be in part due to the work of this CSO. Um, another case in point, uh, this is a case that I tried in um, 2019, it was my last trial. Um, this was the Warfa Vialli case. It was relating to crimes against humanity committed under the Bari regime in the late 1980s in Somalia. Um, and well, I, I point this particular one out, not because the collaboration was particularly unique, um, but because it happened at a time during the, the Trump administration, during a time when the Department of Homeland Security was um, not necessarily operating in a political environment where it would be easy um, to support this kind of a case, but our the US Department of Homeland Security did in fact have a case open against um, this individual. And while they couldn't just bring him in to support their case, um, they could provide us some behind the scenes advice mm -hmm. on how to bring in, how to parole our client into the United States since under that administration, he could not get a visa as a Somali individual. Um, so that's, don't get me started on all of that. If it were not for this parole, uh, Farhan, our client would not have been allowed to attend his trial in person. And of course, again, we presented our evidence then back to the Department of Homeland Security. And if this individual is ever deported, I, I think it is safe to say it wouldn't have happened without the CSOs behind the case, particularly because the US is not allowed to travel to Somalia. So there's an example of free movement. Um, 
A different kind of case in Guatemala, this is the Seprazarco trial. It was this, the first ever sexual slavery case tried in a national court. And this case was investigated, I believe, for about 15 years before it was ever brought to trial by CSOs, CSOs in Guatemala. It was an alliance of NGOs. They investigated, they provided the, the victims with information, with support, with psychosocial support. They put together an inter-American court case and won. Um, and they filed criminal complaints um, in, the criminal, in the Guatemalan criminal justice system. Um, some of some of the people they were serving chose to do that. And, um, you know, the prosecutors and the victim lawyers, this here they are all sitting together at trial. Um, they work together in ways that reflected the needs of the victims in that case. Right. So the, the victims didn't want to testify in open court. They were concerned about it. So their testimony was taken by video. That was a request that was put in through the CSOs and that the prosecutors respected. Um, they were allowed to go into court. As you can see, many of them are covering their faces. Um, over the course of the case, they covered their faces less and less. And by the time that they won their trial and secured a conviction, they are now attending trials as kind of the, the godmothers of these, of these cases very proudly and very openly. Um, but without the CSOs, there wouldn't have been a case. Without the prosecutors, there wouldn't have been a case. Um, so the collaboration was essential. This is my last example now, as I think I'm probably close on time. Um, in in the in Kosovo, um, there's so many examples. We've been working there for a while, but one example I thought was worth highlighting is that you know the the victims in Kosovo one one of the legal requirements is they have to make a petition in the police station, um, which is super problematic for lots of reasons that you might imagine, um, but one of the NGOs that's serving torture survivors and survivors of sexual violence, Kosovo Rehabilitation Center for Torture Victims, um, set up a protocol with law enforcement that would allow law enforcement and victims to interact outside of the station in a way that would protect their identities. Um, and I, I will note that if it had not happened, that well, when we started working there, there were zero cases of sexual conflict-related sexual violence working their way through the courts. There are at least 50 in process now. And I would submit that that would not have happened without the collaboration, collaborations like this between CEOs and the police. And um, I will leave, I will leave that. Yeah, there's a lot in that presentation that I think is going to be really useful to tease out. Some of the questions that that I come to mind immediately, um, just speaking from our North Korea work is, you know, is there ever a reason not to collect some data? Or another one might more specifically be like, how do we decide what kind of data to hand over and when? Um, and I'm sure that a lot of the other documenters here will have similar questions we can talk about in the Q&A. So thank you for that. Um, we'll switch now. Uh, to our final presentation, uh, to Sun Kim, who is also really part of the genesis for the, uh, the this conversation today. Uh, she's a legal officer at the United Nations Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar, the IIIM, uh, which is mandated to collect, consolidate, preserve, and analyze evidence of serious crimes and other violations of international law committed in Myanmar since 2011. Um, before that, she's worked as a staff attorney, attorney at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, she's also had experience in former Yugoslavia uh, and Cambodia. Um, and so she really has a, a broad base of experience to speak to from today. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll turn things over to you, Sun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Scott. I'm glad that we've come this far from our first conversation at last year's RightsCon. So it's nice to see everybody here. And it was great to hear everyone else's presentations. I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Myanmar mechanism and then some of the challenges that we face as an investigative mechanism. So as Scott said, the Human Rights Council established the Myanmar mechanism in September of 2018. And our mandate is to collect, consolidate, preserve, and analyze evidence of the most serious international crimes and violations of international law committed in Myanmar since 2011. 
So that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll break that down. So basically what we are is an investigative mechanism, which means we're not a court, we're not a tribunal, we're not a prosecutor's office, but we are a, a UN entity and we're here to collect evidence. We also analyze it, we preserve it, and hopefully we will share it, what we call onward sharing. So we will share with national, regional, or international courts or tribunals or other legal proceedings that may have jurisdiction over crimes within our mandate. So you've probably heard about the Myanmar mechanism in relation to the Rohingya situation, um, the clearance operation that started at the end of 2016 through the end of 2017. Um, the UN fact-finding mission concluded that there are reasonable grounds to believe that serious international crimes had been committed in Myanmar. The two most highlighted, I guess the most well-known and most publicized instances of where the mechanism is cooperating and sharing information is first with the International Criminal Court, which opened a case, Bangladesh, Myanmar, on deportation and persecution. And the second is the International Court of Justice, which is not a criminal proceeding per se, because it's a state to state, what we call a contentious proceeding. So the Gambia brought a case against Myanmar under the Genocide Convention um, at the International Court of Justice. We are hoping that, as I always pointed out, we're hoping that someday, you know, we will also have uh, French or German prosecutors or war crimes offices contacting us, asking us for information, or as Kathy pointed out, other national prosecutors offices who want information because they either want to cooperate with cases it could be in the United States, it could be in their countries under universal jurisdiction. Perhaps there will be cases in Myanmar someday as well. But as you can imagine, we have a lot of challenges. The first one is no access to the country. And I think anyone working on Syria is well aware of that. Same with everyone who's working on DPKR. It's quite hard to collect anything evidence, things that will be used as evidence in the future when you don't have physical access to the ground, to the country, to the victims, to the witnesses directly. Um, we have consistently requested that the government of Myanmar give us access to Myanmar and the government has denied the access. As you can imagine, um, the work at the mechanism has been quite busy since February of this year since the military seizure of power in Myanmar and all of the current events that have been going on in Myanmar since then. I, this is my personal opinion, but I do believe that at this point, it's early June, um, there is reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity of some sort have been taking place in Myanmar in the military's reaction to the peaceful democratic protests there. I think um, one of the challenges that I'd like to highlight for the CSO community, and I'm glad that Kathy mentioned that we need to be cognizant of the mandate of different organizations, and they're not really there to do the collection work for us. Great examples with the ICRC, MSF, et cetera. But one of the challenges I think that a mechanism encounters is um, when we receive reports from CSOs that contain underlying witness information, we often need to find consent from those witnesses. So consent for the witnesses to share their statements with the mechanism, which is quite tricky because we were not around um, when there were CSOs documenting the Rohingya clearance operations in 2016 and 2017. But I think if, one, if there's one takeaway, um, I would advise that it would be great if people could think about maybe having consent um, as part of the witness interview or the witness statement taking. So it could be open-ended for some sort of future international investigative mechanism, such as the Myanmar mechanism, or for national, regional, or other international tribunals, courts, proceedings, what have you. And I think the tricky thing there is that, of course, we know that in criminal proceedings, your statements, uh, witnesses' names, potentially uh, identifying information needs to be shared with all parties to the proceeding. And that might um, concern witnesses, especially if 
it's going to be shared with the accused and his or her lawyers, the defense team. In the case of the International Court of Justice proceedings, it needs to be shared with the government of Myanmar. So these are some of the issues. I don't have all of the solutions and I definitely don't have answers, but these are things that it would be great for CSOs and you know the UN and uh, legals people working in this field to just continue this conversation to see what is the what are the challenges, what can we do to make it better. I also want to close on one thing, which is quite important to us, is that um, we really want to avoid re-traumatization of witnesses. So there is a lot of documentation that happens on the ground by different organizations when there are mass atrocities committed. And what we want to prevent is victims, survivors, witnesses having to give their testimony, tell their story again and again to different organizations and different people and re-traumatize them. And years later, we don't want to have to you know, go back. <laughs> You're going to have to actually in legal proceedings. So part of our goal in collecting underlying witness statements from people who have done the documenting is to do exactly that, is to find out what really happened and to prevent the re-traumatization. So I'll just close with that. Um, I'm open for questions. Um, people are feel free to contact me if they want about uh, the mechanism or the work that we do. Thank you so much, Sun. Um, I think that's a there's a few really important things in there, uh, like the importance of informed consent and avoiding re-traumatization. And I think maybe um, this is a question that we have as documenters too, but is a, is kind of a core question is that I, I guess a mechanism like the double I double M also maps where the information is and maps which which people have which kinds of uh, stories of abuse or have experienced certain abuses. So um, yeah, be curious to see if other documenters have uh, more questions along those lines. Um, but uh, so we're, we've arrived at the Q&A. Um, I think uh, the easiest way to get started might be um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to hit that raise hand button or to type a question in the chat. Uh, I just want to remind people again who might have joined a little bit later, we are recording. So if you do want your identity removed from this, uh, while we're editing the video, we can uh, block out your identity, your name, your voice, or the video. Just let us know. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions, uh, please raise the hand. Um, if not, uh, Mary, I believe you had um, a couple questions for the group. Um, yeah, I do. Just coming, actually, there are questions from Clara Vise. Um, she had to leave because she's in the midst of a memorial. Uh, it's 10 years since her brother and sister-in-law were, were murdered. Um, and this week in Brazil is a, a week of remembering uh, environmental activists who've been killed or land defenders who've been murdered. So she apologizes for having to, to leave. But um, one of her questions that she put forth is, and I think has been answered to an extent, but what is the role of the state? And what is the role, you know, what are the distinctions between doing this kind of work in a country where the state is supportive and, and, and in, in situations where the state is committing the atrocities? Um, and then the other question that she put forward is the question of, <clears throat> resistance to technology. So one thing that you said, Scott, was that it's often done in kind of a pen and paper um, documentation. And so, you know, as we come in with things like Tello, yeah, what, how is this, how is this received when, when it's not the kind of more traditional pen and paper documentation and, and what are the challenges and opportunities that something like an app that's collected that the people who are suffering the atrocities are the ones documenting it or suffering the violations. And so, you know, what are the barriers or resistance to that, um, both in terms of the use of it, but also, you know, I guess on both sides, both the civil societies using those sorts of, of documentation methods, but also in the legal process, will they be taken the same way as a 
traditional pen and paper documentation. I'm not sure if I phrase that very clearly. Um, because for us, you know, a lot of this for us is 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 making giving people the this, the tools to document what's going on in, in their own communities. Um, but how do you make sure that that is then taken seriously and 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 usable in in a in a legal process is the big question mark for us. I can I can speak a little bit to the to the second one. I I think the the roles question is a really hard one because it's very context specific, and I think both AWIS and SEN can speak better than I can to oppositional governments that you're investigating. It's obviously a different different situation. But um, as far as, as um, the apps, and, and I'm familiar, I'm more familiar with some different ones, but they're very useful for corroborating, authenticating testimony. Um, but the key thing to remember about any kind of document or thing or item or whether it's um, virtual or physical is that you're, you're almost never going to be able to introduce that into a process without a witness. There's, you know, if you're the one who collected it, you're a witness. If if you are unreachable, maybe somebody else who saw the same thing happen can create a kind of corroborating witness to introduce it. Maybe an expert can, but you're you're just not going to be able to create evidence that is self-sufficient because eyewitnesses are are sort of the the bedrock of the legal process. I can I can add like something to what Kathy like um, mentioned. It's, it's really important that she mentioned actually depends on my experience with the national prosecutors in the EU. Once we shared like some piece of data or evidence, they only demanding or requesting the witnesses. They need to listen to the witness. even like sometimes I shared like some statements or whatever lie they need finally to speak to the original one. Where is that witness? Uh, I agree, like it's the most most important one in all of the investigation that I engage in, whatever in Sweden, in Netherlands, in Germany, and France, there is a lot around, but the, the best one, it, it was like the witnesses, insiders' witnesses, it's also really, really important for, for engaging in. Uh, but actually there is some cases in the EU uh, in, in regarding to the, for example, to the former fighters in Syria who have been smuggled to the EU, that the, the judge actually depends only for the social media, sometimes the pictures for the social media. For example, in, in one case in Sweden, the, the judge like um, a sentence for some former fighters just for he was like showed in, in, in some videos or pictures in the social media in the Facebook he was uh, standing on some death bodies for example or humiliating the, the dignity. So some some cases was like the social media or, or the open source data let's say, let's say it's really important. I, I totally agree that always they requesting witnesses. So it's the most the relevant witnesses for, for the the for the first six questions I, I it's the most difficult actually we, we faced in Syria because we have we don't have like an access to the to the area. Triple IM is always suffering triple IM Syria. And so I see a commission of inquiry always like suffering demand requesting for access to the to the areas and the Syrian government because it's the majority of the part of the validation in Syria is came from the Syrian government. So it's a, it's a, a part of the atrocity which committee. So but no one know what's who might be like change in the future? Maybe we can something change in, in the, on the ground. We don't know, but we have like to prepare ourselves well. Collecting data from around it's really hard. And I actually, I, I um, as as soon can like mention, there is something really really interesting in all like in Yemeni context, in Syrian context, in Libyan context. Once I conducting some interview, some trainings for for some human rights defenders or activists, I receive especially like one questions. Uh, how, like for the informed consent, uh, especially, the, the, the person sometimes like really hesitate for engaging and providing their informed consent or signing something for the statement. Sometimes they, they providing like verbally, just like, ah, okay, I accept it for sharing with Triple IM, which is you with any NGOs, but without like real statement or signing, I'm not sure how we can deal like with that in the future. Sometimes we can like, but that if the, if the witness is, is like it's here and we can connect him directly to the prosecutor from that, but, but it's still like there is a lot of challenges for working outside outside the country, which like it's still blocked for for and the real evidence, honestly, it, it will be like discovered in the future after after we can access to the to 
the security military branches, for example, some intelligence facilities, some some former fighters. As as you see, for after ISIS defeated in in, in the northeast of Syria in 2018, a huge and millions of like data and and uh, hard drives have been found after the the ISIS have been defeated by international coalition. So there is like like not a treasury of data, but before that, once it was blocked, it was so hard for accessing and reach out for witnesses. Or so it's, it's so, so complicated. Maybe some can can introduce like that uh, this question, which came like a lot from a lot of context. How we can like overcome some hesitation of the witnesses for or survivors or whatever for signing any statement, signing the informed consent, providing the info. Okay, they they are uh, they are accepting. They are like they have like real consent. But it's not written. I, I mean, I do understand the safety and security concerns of witnesses, which we take very seriously. And without access to the country, it's hard to do a security risk assessment of anybody inside the country. So, um, you know, the communications with people inside the country are quite limited. Um, and then just, you know, as everyone knows with COVID, uh, travel to the region has just been, you know, completely restricted this past year and a half. So. Hopefully the COVID situation will get better and um, staff from the mechanism can travel to the region. But I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, in my previous job, at least with the Yugoslavia tribunal, it was clear that witnesses um, want accountability. And that doesn't necessarily mean legal process, as Kathy pointed out, but they are wanting some sort of accountability. And so I do think on the whole, um, people find it very valuable that their stories are told, that they're told in court. Um, but again, you know, people's situations can change over the course of years, but it's just hard to assess um, safety and security of witnesses. Um, so actually, Sun, I, I had another um, question for you. Um, and this, this is a, a little bit focused on um, Myanmar specifically, but I wonder if anybody else in the webinar has had a similar experience. Um, what what do you do or what can be done if a witness is not accessible? Um, so on our North Korean documentation um, for the, our disappearances project, we recognize that a lot of the people who are the family members are actually aging um, and so eventually are passing away. And so with them, uh, we can preserve some of the documentation or their statements, but uh, we don't necessarily have the uh, living link to to the person that was that was taken, you know, decades ago. Um, and I'm also thinking about in the Myanmar context, the people in Cox's Bazar, where um, you know restrictions have have increased and decreased over time. But um, in Cox's Bazar, where NGOs have gone in, um, taken statements, even done the extra steps of uh, getting informed consent, but then maybe relocating that witness again later on could be really challenging. Um, so if they're moved out of Cox Bazaar to another location, um, maybe they have the same cell phone number, but you know maybe the cell phone number gets changed and it's just easy to get to lose contact with those people. Um, so is there any way to mitigate that? Is there any way to to kind of get around that problem? Yeah, I mean, I'm also open to hearing ideas from other people, especially people who work more in the field. Um, I do think that all of these investigative mechanisms rely heavily on CSOs, NGOs, interlocutors, intermediaries, people who work in, let's say, for example, Cox's Bazaar, who are familiar with the camp, who are familiar with the communities, who are members of the community. Um, it's, just, it's important to establish those relationships and make sure we do, yeah, try to keep the contact information. And of course, um, you know, in my experience, most refugees, all they want is to go home. So what if they do get to go home? And then um, it's also then harder to get a hold of them if they do return home. So yeah, I'm open to any kind of ideas, suggestions, yeah, discussion on that issue too. I have a suggestion on that, but I think that there's a challenge that comes right back with it because of issues of consent. But um, often the best way to keep track of someone is not to have their cell phone number, but well, maybe to have that, but 
to um, know who their their best contact is to ask who is their best contact. Maybe it's a son or a daughter, maybe it's a religious leader, maybe it's a human rights activist. Maybe you know it can be a, any number of people, but those those contact people end up being the most useful for tracking people down when they are moving through different um, sort of unstable environments. At least in my experience, that's been the most useful. But that usually you need that person as well to consent even to collect their information, right? So, so there's there's a double issue, but that is a I found to be a pretty effective way to track people. Uh, yeah, the, leading to that questions of this maintenance of the contact, the living contact. And then the in most cases, as most, yeah, this NGOs, grassroots groups doesn't have the main powers or, you know, it's allocated for the regularly make a call and then to make sure that, you know, the the when the contact is, is constant. And so the, usually the interviewees is easily forget that who they met or the, who they provide this information or the testimonies. And so so the first question is that the, if anybody have encountered of that the any organizations in your network have the very constant procedures of that by how many years of that they set the regular the phone call check or the email contact check. And then the other question is that the because of many limited situations that there's in our organizations that we adopted very limited method of the giving them the our permanent number. So is it become important for us to maintain our office number become permanent, not be stolen or not be taken by others and indicate and also the telling them to whenever you want to reject or just cancel your testimonies in the fear of being, you know, the their testimony being work against them and then they can contact us. So the telling them to and ask them to the, keep in mind of that when the trial happens in the future and then we don't know that you know how many decades are necessary and then just keep it and then preserve it and then this, when you see that trial is coming up and then please contact us too and then you even like just asking them they're more proactive yeah the leads to us because it might be really impossible for us to reach out and just control and just managing all the bright with the contact hundreds of thousands of contacts so this is a very limited solution we now apply. Thank you. Uh, so there's, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, there's a question actually from one of our researchers in the chat. Uh, I'll just read it out loud. It's a question for Sun. Um, how is the work of the IIIM distinguished from that of the IIFFM? The Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. And I think this is relevant to a lot of other contexts. What would it take to create an equivalent for the DPRK or for another country uh, at the UN Human Rights Council or General Assembly? I think that's a great question. And I'm so glad someone asked that because there's a lot of confusion about what was the FFM versus what is the IIIM. So um, the FFM was an international independent fact-finding mission on Myanmar, and it's over. So they shut their doors. They report. They wrote all their reports, which were really, really good. And because of that, actually, it was the report that came out of the fact-finding mission that spurred the creation of the mechanism. And so the fact-finding mission did a great job documenting serious human rights violations and focused on all of Myanmar, which was is also very important. So our territorial scope consists of all of Myanmar, um, even though uh, maybe prior to February of this year, the issue that got the most attention was the Rohingya situation. So um, what does it take? <laughs> um, I believe, I wasn't there for it, but I believe it takes a lot of advocacy from the CSO community to advocate at the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council to create a similar investigative mechanism. I do think that there is a little more political will these days to create investigative mechanisms that there used to be when the Security Council used to create ad hoc tribunals or um, states used to come together to create an international criminal court. There is, there seems to be political will at the Human Rights Council, at the General Assembly to create these investigative mechanisms. And so I do leave it up to the advocacy community to advocate for what you want to create. 
Okay, great. Um, so that's perfect. We're exactly out of time. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to all the speakers uh, for your participation and also for the important work that you do um, in, percent of, in pursuit of justice and human rights. Uh, thank you also to all of those of you who attended. We hope to connect with you again um, so that this conversation isn't just a one-off, but um, this sparks and continues uh, mutual support and knowledge sharing. So um, please, if you get a chance, um, we'll post some of the uh, links um, on our websites. And then as well, if you have any questions, you can shoot them to info at accessaccountability.org and we'll make sure that it reaches the right person. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hoping uh, to hear from you more in the future.